start by um, explaining a little bit where the title of this uh, paper comes from. And this paper is part of a wider project we have at the Overseas Development Institute that's called Development Progress. And within that, we have a component <coughs> sorry, that's focusing on, how, um, on looking at how the different measures of progress uh, affect our, our view of it. And within that, we're looking also at uh, the distribution of progress within countries and across groups and to aim to develop a better understanding of inequality and those being left behind. So within that, I'm focusing on intra-household inequalities in children in different dimensions of well-being. And the main motivation for this study is that until recently, um, many measures of well-being have treated, treated households as if their members enjoyed a fair and equal share of resources, whether that's um, money, whether that's consumption goods, investments, etc. But when um, particular individuals are not uh, enjoying the, 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 their share of, of these resources, some of them could effectively be in poverty, even when the household average indicates the contrary. Uh, in particular, in the case of children, systematic biases against boys or against girls in several areas of their well-being could affect um, their chances of uh, lifetime poverty or could um, leave them in underachievement over the long run. So um, this paper at attempts to measure the degree of intra-household inequalities, that is inequalities that occur w inside the households between boys and girls, and um, to relate it to overall levels of inequality and to um, progress in child well-being. Um, most likely the lack of data on individual children is the main limitation when trying to measure inter-household inequalities. Uh, we now, however, have much better data. International household survey programs, such as the, the DHS uh, that's had been used, and the multiple indicator cluster surveys from UNICEF have made it possible to review progress towards the improvement of um, child well-being, uh, the child-focused MDGs, and the commitments of countries towards the conventions of the rights of child. For example, we know under MDG1 that hunger and undernutrition in children has been reducing, although some, some um, gaps are still exist in, in some regions such as South Asia. We know that um, over 90% of children have achieved, uh, ha are enrolled in uh, primary education and that gaps between boys and girls are reducing. However, there's still other, um, there's still other gaps that are interesting to look, and, and I'm focusing on the gaps that occur within households. There are three approaches that could be used. The first one would be to compare average outcomes in a country between boys and girls. And this would give you a sense of the gender differences, but not really of the intra-household differences. The second approach would be to use a regression with a gender dummy to see, again, gender, uh, gender differences. And you could include a household fixed effects to control for, for children in, in the same household. And the third approach is to use an inequality index such as um, a Gini or a general entropy index uh, and then decompose it into uh, the between component and the within group component. And you can use the households as the defining groups to see how much of that inequality occurs within and, and between households. And that this has been um, used before. For example, San and Younger use it to measure uh, differences in body mass index for adults. And, and I use a very similar approach. Um, I use two basic inequality measures. The first one is just um, the share of the households with a gender bias. So this is derived from household ratios of achievements between boys and girls. And this would only tell you whether uh, boys in a household are, are more advantaged or girls are more advantaged. And the second is, uh, is I use this um, inequality index. I use a tail index uh, in, in the same way that San and Younger do, and decompose it into the two components using the households as, as the groups. However, there's, there is one um, limitation, that is that when you use these indices, you need uh, cardinal data. And for many indicators of child well-being, you don't necessarily have that. So what to do then? So what I do is, is very simple, is because I'm interested in the differences between boys and girls, for each household, I reconstruct the variable that is the, the share of girls in a household that are above a certain threshold. So for example, the, the share of girls in a household that are stunted or not stunted, and the same for boys. So each household would end up with 
two observations that are cardinal, and with that I can construct the, the tail index and then decompose it and have a sense of, of the um, contribution of intra-household inequalities. Um, then again, um, there is a bit of an interest of looking at multidimensional well-being in, in children because there are many things that affect uh, how children develop. And the dimensions are drawn from the Convention of the Rights of Child. Um, and there is a data limitation. Uh, the convention defines 17 dimensions. I'm only able to look at four of, of those because we need information for individual children, not for the household, and for boys and girls separately. So sometimes you have information for individual children, but say just one child in the household. Um, that's, that's not enough for, for this measure. So I use stunting, birth registration, school attendance, and um, the time spent doing work and chores. First, I look at each of the dimensions separately, and then I try to have a sense of how inequalities within household uh, are jointly distributed. And, and I'll explain this a little bit further in a minute. Um, data comes from the mixed service from UNICEF for about 20 countries, but Again, not all information is available for the countries, um, so it, it varies a bit. And I'll use the two latest surveys available for each country, which roughly corresponds to a five-year gap between surveys. I'll just explain um, a little bit of the results for, for one dimension. Uh, before that, um, I also did um, construct a Gini coefficient just because it's easier to compare the overall level of inequality, but, but the Gini is not uh, decomposable, so, so I don't use it afterwards. But uh, with the Gini, we can see that um, inequalities, total inequalities in stunting and working hours are particularly high. The Gini is about 0.7. Um, inequalities for birth registration are in the medium level, around 0.4, and in schooling, uh, they're much lower, just 0 0.18. And then how much of that inequality occurs within households, inside the households. So in the case of stunting, you can see in the graph, um, the, the blue below is the within household component and the cream is the between household component. And there is great variability across countries. But for some of these countries, in, in, in an average for all of them, it's around 20%. And for some countries, it, it's much higher. The extreme case is Leo here, it's about 40% of total inequality occurs within households. So that's very important, that's, that's the first thing. So then um, I tried to look at how this relates to um, the overall levels of well-being and the overall levels of inequality in the country. So in the case of, of stunting, um, when there's higher well-being, total inequality is actually higher, so, so it is a problem. But within household, in absolute and in relative terms, is lower. That's a similar case occurs for working hours. But in the case of birth registration and school attendance, even when total inequality is lower, or when there's um, improvements in well-being, when there's higher well-being, the share of within household inequality is higher in relative terms. That means that it's possible that the harder gaps to address are there, are inside households rather than across them. And, and this graph shows uh, more or less um, what I just explained. This is just a plot of, of all the observations. And um, in this axis, we have the, the total level of inequality. And on the um, bottom axis, we have the average levels of well-being. So in the case of stunting, closer to the zero is, is more well-being. So it means less stunting. And the final... Um, step is to look at how different inequalities within households relate to each other. Because it's possible that in some households, um, girls are preferred for some aspects, whilst boys are preferred for, for other aspects. So I try to, to look at how things correlate there. So this is a measure of association between um, intra-household inequalities. It's only done for, for each pair combination of indicators because if you try to do it for, for all of them, then um, the number of observations is very limited, which uh, would be the ideal to do that, but um, data doesn't, doesn't really permit that. 
So in, in the first column, we have the association only for boys. In the case, for example, when stunting, and when boys are favored in stunting and birth registration, stunting in school, et cetera. And, and the second column is the same, but for girls only. So we see that around 20% of households tend to favor boys in, in nutrition and birth registration, 48% in, in nutrition and, and school. But there are other cases where, where a larger share of households favor girls. So take, for instance, stunting and work. 55% of households tend to favor girls. And this is, this is an aggregate for, for all the countries that had available data. But this varies widely across countries. So take, for example, the case of uh, nutrition and schooling. There are countries such as Swaziland where 27% of, uh, of households favor boys. But there are other countries such as Albania where, where that share is 70%, so it's, it's much higher. And, and overall, when we see um, at the aggregate, um, there is a lot of variation across countries. Countries such as Kazakhstan, Albania, uh, Belize tend to favor boys in most of the pairings. While there are other countries such as Burundi and Cameroon where um, in most pairings, households tend to favor girls. And there are others where, where the evidence is not conclusive. So let me go back a bit to, to the main headlines of the results. Um, so first of all, um, Although there is a wide range across countries, um, inequalities between boys and girls within households can be pronounced. Uh, in, in the worst case, there are up to 63% of total inequality, and, and that's a lot. Second, that e even when uh, in absolute terms they're not very big, they can be big in relative terms. And that's important because it can point to where the hardest gap to address are. And the third headline in the uh, result is that um, there is not a clear bias against girls or boys, contrary to popular belief, but not contrary to other evidence from academic studies. In some cases, girls are favored. In some cases, boys are favored. And, and the same occurs when we look at the pair combination of, of indicators. So what can we conclude from here? First, that although there is a um, huge amount of progress in many of the indicators of child well-being, not so much in others, um, it is not possible to eliminate child poverty and secure all the rights of children unless this type of disparities are addressed. It, it is often the harder gaps to, to realize progress. And second, that there is no clear bias against one or the other gender. It, it depends a lot on, on the country and depends on the indicator or the combination of indicators. And this may be because uh, biases respond to different social norms, different household institutions, marriage institutions, etc. And these are different across countries. So, more research would be needed to understand whether these um, aspects are common across countries or differ, and, and how, and what are the right uh, policies if you would wish to address this type of inequalities. That's all.